welcome everyone thank you to those who are listening in live and to those who will be listening in afterwards i would also like to extend my warm welcome to all our guest speakers today uh, whom i'll be introducing very shortly our webinar today is titled pharmacy engagement in tuberculosis prevention and care tuberculosis is a preventable and curable disease however according to world health organization uh, in 2022 that is two years back it affected more than 10.6 million people worldwide and out of these 1.3 million deaths occurred tb occurs in all countries and in people of all ages tb mdr that is the multi drug resistant tb remains a major public health crisis and a threat to health security with only 2 out of 5 yes only 2 out of 5 people reaching the treatment this is the statistics from who for year 2022 in this digital event the experts will explore the role of pharmacists in fight against the tb and how we can leverage it further the event marks the world tb day as everyone knows 24th march is the world tb day and this event aims to strengthen the pharmacy engagement foster the collaboration and contribute to a tb free world through collective expertise and commitment today uh we have got the galaxy of the speakers the fabulous speakers that we have can we have the next slide yes so the before i go to the speakers i would like to uh inform you that this digital event will be moderated by professor katia kanyaris from portugal and she is the fip amr commission co chair and myself manjiri gharat from india fip vice president and if i be chair of the amr commission and i'm also vice president of the indian pharmaceutical association coming to our speakers we have brilliant speakers today three of them hana monica dais from who rosalind miller from tb ppm learning network uk and professor tim reddy director of dot post graduate programs from university of bath uk i'll be introducing them in more details in the coming slides uh as you can see before we move to the uh, program the session there are certain announcements which you can read on this slide if you are already familiar and attending regularly the fip digital events uh, maybe this is known to you but uh, let me just read it out again the webinar is being recorded and live streamed via youtube the recording will be available on our website the events.fip.org Uh, we encourage you to ask your questions through Q&A box throughout the presentations throughout the session and me and Katia will ensure that more all of these questions are addressed uh, by the end of the webinar uh, you are welcome to provide your feedback to webinars at fip.org this will not only encourage us but it will also help us to improve uh, our events in future and most importantly If you are not yet a member of FIP, I appeal to you to become a member of FIP. FIP is a global federation representing more than four million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists worldwide. If you are a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical scientist and you would like to become a member of FIP, please register on FIP's website fip.org and become a member of this global pharmacist family. uh i want to thank our colleagues from turkish for the turkish translation and that is available on zoom via the translation icon which you can see on the slide so thank you very much to our colleagues uh, who are uh, giving us this turkish translation live thank you so today's program we are right now at the introduction and the welcome by myself and katya and then we have three uh session three uh talks and the first one will be who global tuberculosis program which will be delivered by hana monica dais who is the cross cutting lead multi sectoral engagement and accountability who flagship initiative to ntb public private mix and tb elimination and the global tuberculosis program at world health organization the second uh, talk will be prevention is better than cure the pharmacist role in reducing the tb drug resistance and that will be dr t marini the director of tod post graduate program university of bath in uk how can pharmacists be more effectively involved in tb care 
and this will be spoken by Dr. Rosalind Miller. She's the TB. She's from TB PPM Learning Network from United Kingdom. And then we will have question and answers, and our experts will answer all the questions which are raised by our uh, attendees, and then there will be wrap up and conclusion. So this is the overall program uh, for today's digital event. There are several learning objectives. At the end of the webinar, the attendees will learn about the global burden of TB, including the key statistics and the trends provided by WHO Global Tuberculosis Program. What role the pharmacist can play in the fight against TB? Strategies for strengthening the pharmacist engagement in TB prevention and care. The info graphic for managing cough and other tuberculosis presumptive symptoms in the pharmacy and the role of pharmacists in TB drug resistance control. So these are several learning objectives of today's digital events. And I'm sure our experts' presentations will ensure that these objectives are met. A uh, long back, FIP and WHO started working together in the battle against TB. And the joint statement by WHO and FIP, the role of pharmacists in tuberculosis care and control, was signed in year 2011 during the FIP Congress at Hyderabad in India. And this joint statement focuses on the role of pharmacists that can be actively involved, who will be actively involved in delivering the care uh, for the TB patient. More about this joint statement, which is a major milestone in the TB PPM, will be uh, talked about by our speaker today, uh, Ms. Monica. I would like to draw your attention to one more important policy statement, and that is the FIP statement of policy on mitigating antimicrobial resistance through antimicrobial stewardship. As everyone knows that AMR is a major global public uh, threat, and in uh, even in tuberculosis, there are cases of MDR, as we are talking about, and XDR TB. So this FIP statement of policy uh, is adopted by FIP Council on 24th September 2023 uh, during the FIP Congress, which was held at Brisbane, Australia. And you can see the statement on the FIP website. Now, before we go to the Global Tuberculosis Program, uh, I would like to talk about very briefly about the situation of tuberculosis in India. As many of you already be knowing that in India, we have uh, more than one fourth, more than 25% of the global TB burden is in India. And TB has been everybody's, fighting with TB has been everybody's responsibility. Looking at this TB situation in India and considering that we have more than 800,000 community pharmacies, yes, more than 0.8 million community pharmacies across India, Indian Pharmaceutical Association took an initiative in year 2005 uh, to engage the pharmacists in this national TB control program to strengthen the program and to, uh, to take it further increase its outreach. And the community pharmacists in Mumbai first were trained and uh, they acted with the due training. Uh, this TB PPM model was developed. The public-private partnership model was developed. And the pharmacists were trained to refer the chest symptomatic cases, to do the DOTS TB medicine provision through the pharmacies, uh, do the community awareness and rational use of antibiotics. So this was a very successful project in Mumbai, which was then uh, expanded to other parts of the country. And pharmacists did a remarkable job, considering that in India it then and even now, the pharmacists are considered more as traders than the healthcare professional. Uh, this project was very, very much appreciated world over. And thanks to FIP for taking this project, take, talking about this project, uh, during the FIP Congresses. So it became well known to the world and many of the LMIC, low and middle income countries, uh, worked on a similar model for their countries. If you would like to know more about this project, then please visit IPS website where we have a whole project, uh, the handbook on the project, Pharmacist at the Frontline, a novel approach at combating TB. So we come to the first presentation after I have spoken about the TB situation in India. 
and a pharmacist role that Indian pharmacists have played uh, in the fight against tuberculosis. Uh, we have the first speaker, as I said, Hannah Monica Dias, and she's from the Global Tuberculosis Program, uh, WHO flagship initiative to NTB, uh, and she's best in WHO uh, Geneva. So I welcome Monica for your presentation, and thank you very much for making time for, to join this digital event. Welcome, Monica. Thanks so much, Manjuri, for that excellent um, introduction uh, to the entire event, as well as the very gracious introduction um, of myself. So, dear colleagues, it's great to see um, over 260 people connected. Um, it's, uh, you know, this is a very... Um, important audience for the fight to end TB and in the lead up to World Tuberculosis Day, which falls on 24th March on Sunday, it's good to see this level of interest and engagement. For us, it's Friday afternoon, and I'm sure looking at all the different people connected, for some of you, it's morning, day, night. Um, so it's really great to see this enthusiasm to end TB. As Manjari said, I will be giving an overview of the global context, the key priorities, targets, commitments, as well as an overview of, um, of what role pharmacists can play to NTB. So to start with, just to remind everyone here, TB is one of the top infectious killers. This has been already said, um, also the leading cause of death for people with HIV and a major contributor to antimicrobial resistance. The numbers are huge. 1.3 million people lost their lives. Um, in 2022, 10.6 million people fall ill annually. Drug-resistant TB burden is close to half a million. And of course, a quarter of the world's population is estimated to have TB infection, which is a precursor for disease. And as Manjuri has said right at the start, TB is a preventable and curable disease. It's been around for millennia and there's no reason it should. And we need to really join forces to stamp this out. It affects every country in the world. There's no country which can say that they're completely free of TB. More than 85% of the global burden is in 30 countries. And here you can see very quickly the breakdown among men, women, and children. Now, um, according to the Global Tuberculosis Report released by the World Health Organization, um, over 3 million people, so we estimate that there are 10.6 million people who fall ill with TB. Um, we've uh, only 7.5 million people have been reached with care. So we estimate 3 million people miss out on access to care. But what we do know is that of this 3 million people, many of them go to care providers, um, you know, private health care providers, including pharmacies, as the first point of care. So if you're looking at narrowing this gap, then engagement of pharmacies is going to be really critical. Likewise, drug-resistant TB remains a public health crisis. And again, here there are huge gaps. Only two in five people with drug-resistant TB access treatment. Again, engaging all care providers, including pharmacists, is important here. So we have some good news. We have um, a whole range of commitments and targets from the NTB strategy released in 2015, all the way to commitments made by heads of state and world leaders. So this is something for um, the fight against tuberculosis. It's something that we've seen really get up to that level of political prioritization only around the past five years since 2018 and now in 2023 where we've uh, where we had the second UN high level meeting on TB and there were targets so there were three UN high level meetings held which brings together world leaders so this is why it's so important where they deliberate on you know what are the key priorities the um, uh, high level meeting on tuberculosis was the one which had a concrete declaration with clear targets and the targets are listed here the ones that i would say that are relevant to our discussion is a 90 percent reaching 90 percent of people with tb treatment coverage 90 percent of people with preventive treatment 100 percent coverage with rapid diagnostic testing 
Also, um, to a certain extent, looking at coverage of health and social benefits, 100%, and closing financing gaps, and of course, pushing towards a new vaccine. Now, we're talking about, over the next five years, a real accelerated push, because you know our target in line with the Sustainable Development Goals and NTB strategy is to end TB by the year 2030. But we're still far away from that goal. So there needs to be this five-year push between uh, you know, this year and 2027 to make sure we get there. And this is why these targets are so um, incredibly critical. And pharmacies have a major role to play um, in helping us get there. There are several other targets mentioned, which includes addressing the needs of people vulnerable to TB, um, including children, the drug resistant crisis, linkages to universal health coverage, looking at the humanitarian crises, especially in times of conflict and war, uh, civil society engagement and the like. But flagging these top three because they're critical um, at the primary healthcare level. Pharmacies are often uh, number one point of care. When you look at people vulnerable to TB also, again, the, the point of care is often pharmacies are uh, the route to get there. So again, underlining the real importance of this. There are other targets, of course, um, including strengthening research, promoting affordable medicines and safe, effective quality medicines. So the rational use of medicines is really critical. Manjuri showed you the WHO FIP statement, and I'll come to that later. But that statement, I remember because I was involved at that time also with Manjuri and other colleagues in FIP was quite critical to en to enable the rational use of anti tb medicines which was you know being prescribed over the counter it wasn't very safe uh, for people you know it was building drug resistance so a lot of important steps um, were taken and affordable promoting quality affordable medicines is key Multi-sectoral accountability and engagement is critical. Again, one of the key sectors, one of the key players of pharmacies here. And again, um, reaffirming the central role of WHO. This has been highlighted clearly in the political declaration. And this is why we are prioritizing this area so much. Um, so let me move forward. So the, the real priority now is to take these commitments by world leaders. So we have commitments at the highest level. It's really critical to ensure it goes all the way down with all hands on deck. So the priority is to translate these to action. WHO is um, in a leading role and committed to taking this work forward with commitment, strong commitment from our director general, we, he has uh, spearheaded a flagship initiative over these five years, very well aligned and which in fact fed into the targets in the political declaration of the UN high level meeting, the targets of closing these gaps in care on the path to universal health coverage. So just to flag very much that it is a priority for WHO. I'm from the Global Tuberculosis Program. The title of the presentation, of course, is on, um, you know, the global Uh, Monica, you, you uh, are in mute. The sound is Monica. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank, you. thank you. Sorry about that. I think I was trying to advance the slides and I hit mute. Apologies, colleagues. So I was just flagging that WHO's Global TB program works with regional and country offices. We have six regional offices and country offices across nearly 170 or 190 countries. Um, to basically move forward on, you know, policy development, uh, research, innovations, technical support, and monitoring and review um, of the state of the TB response. So uh, now coming around to uh, the focus of our discussion. So basically, we're all the big priority is to get to universal health coverage to make sure that no matter where a person accesses care for TB or for any disease, they're able to access quality care. So, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve. And I started off my presentation by saying that still we estimate around 3 million people still miss out on access to care or they access care quite late. 
Um, so we need to really go down to the root of the issue. And here, pharmacies play a big role. As I said, first point of care is often private, unengaged public care providers. This includes pharmacies for a large proportion of people. Uh, unfortunately, while there has been progress over the past several decades on engaging private sector care providers, uh, not all have been fully engaged and pharmacies are one of the players whose full potential hasn't been harnessed. Um, when you look at barriers and access to health services due to inequities, stigma, discrimination, you know, looking at all the vulnerable hard to reach groups, um, the people who can really reach them are care providers such as pharmacies, which are the neighborhood sort of go to uh, for people um, who fall ill or who exhibit symptoms. Um, then the drivers of the epidemic include poverty, undernutrition, HIV, diabetes, tobacco, alcohol use. All of these are quite critical. And as we look at UHC, we need to make sure that we have a multi-sectoral response and engagement across different sectors. And here again, of course, the role of pharmacies and pharmacy associations, rational use of medicines, et cetera, is really key. So coming uh, around to uh, public-private mix, which is what, so here again, showing you like, you know, these are the range of providers that people access. Uh, care and pharmacies, of course, are quite a critical ones. So just re-emphasizing that. And also re-emphasizing that in the seven high priority countries that we have for public-private mix, um, you know, the, the private sector plays quite a big role. And here you can also see uh, initial care seeking. So this is just the numbers to support what I um, was sharing earlier. So ergo, basically engaging all care providers through public-private mix approaches, which is the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector in the overall TB response is one of the major solutions um, to reach all people with TB. And here's the proof. So if you look at trend data from 2010 onwards, and here WHO collects data from nearly 200 countries, and this is the top seven countries which have a huge private sector. Here you can see in blue is the public-private mix, yellow is the public-public mix, public unengaged care provider. So if you look at the blue, you can see that the notification of people diagnosed with TB in several settings has been increasing the contribution to the overall case finding in a country. The contribution of the private sector has been quite critical in reaching those who are affected in countries. So this basically gives you a very clear snapshot of the data basically on the contribution of public-private uh, mix and the role of private care providers like pharmacies. Now at the World Health Organization uh, with partners, um, the PPM Working Group of Stop TB Partnership, USAID, the Global Fund, um, you know, McGill, Path, and other colleagues, we've come together, we have a working group. Um, we we, moved, we, we uh, released in 2018 a roadmap of what can be the key actions to strengthen the, the, the engagement of the private sector in countries in the TB response. We also released two editions of a landscape analysis, which has been quite critical with key models, with uh, case studies and best practices to guide countries on uh, taking this work, work forward. So here outlined are the key steps or key priorities for action as part of the PPM roadmap that we see as a priority, uh, our priorities for countries from setting targets to allocating resources to building partnerships, uh, establishing regulatory frameworks, legal frameworks, policies, um, having incentives, flexible models of engagement, harnessing digital technologies, and uh, you know, monitoring progress to build accountability. All these are the key steps that we are promoting on the path to reach all people with care, especially through the engagement of private care providers, including um, pharmacies. So um, at the start, um, Manjari showed us this statement um, that FIP developed with the World Health Organization way back in 2011. As I mentioned at that time, there were serious concerns. This, so we're talking nearly 
yeah, nearly a decade ago, about more than a decade ago, actually, about, you know, when uh, there was irrational use of anti-TB medicines uh, contributing to drug resistance. And it was the role of pharmacies in this engagement was very clearly seen. And so we had a very good collaboration with L5P. We put out this statement to address uh, the issues. I remember we came to Hyderabad in India for the launch of the statement and the signing with our assistant director general and with the head of um, FIP to take this work forward on uh, you know, scaling up the engagement of pharmacists with key actions, providing joint stewardship, uh, supporting orientation, capacity building, increasing awareness, referral of people, rational use of anti-TB medicines. And here, FIP was playing quite an important role, especially because we needed to have regulatory authorities in place. At that time in India, there was quite a big push to have an HX schedule, basically to ensure that um, you know, um, TB medications were not provided um, unless a prescription was in place. This was a very important step in several countries, actually. And policies were put out to say that you cannot just provide over-the-counter anti-TB medicines unless you have a doctor's uh, prescription. And pharmacists had quite a big role to play. And Manjali already showcased some of the examples from India where there was a lot of work done to ensure rational uh, disbursement of medicines and support to people with TB. Um, also, um, other steps that were outlined was continuous dialogue with health providers, engaging pharmacists and their associations. I remember at that time we visited Cambodia, the Pharmacy Association there was quite key in the engagement of pharmacies. Um, you know, likewise in other countries as well. And of course, having a system to monitor, evaluate and improve collaboration. Now, it's really great that we are here today at this event with FIP again in the lead to promote this work, because as I said at the start, we need all hands on deck to NTB and um, pharmacies play such an important role. So I really hope that this is the start of another a renewed, a reinvigorated collaboration where we can work together uh, to close gaps, to ensure health for all, um, with all of us hand in hand to NTB. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Monica, for this great presentation. We have now a, a question on Q&A, but later we will we'll talk about this, this uh, additional thematics. So welcome all to this FIP webinar. It is in my pleasure to present the, the next speaker. Now we'll have a team. Tim has been working in academia for more than 20 years, bringing experience living and working in the UK, Asia, and Africa. His first degree was in pharmacy, and he is now a fellow of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Uh, his research uh, initially in tuberculosis patient adherence extended to infection diseases, education, and health systems, strengthening in Namibia, and sought to address global health inequalities through higher education, including starting new training programs. So welcome, Tim. Thank you so much for, for being here with us. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katia. Um, I'm sure you'll interrupt if you can't hear, but that was a lovely <laughs> introduction. Um, and uh, a, a delight to come and uh, talk at this event. Um, it's a real privilege. I, I don't say that um, lightly. Uh, I think it might be the largest crowd I've ever spoken to, so that's encouraging. And great to uh, be in the same space as Manjiri as well, I have to mention, because we've been in this space for over 20 years looking at tuberculosis and the pharmacist's role um, in TB control. Um, uh, Manjiri is a an incredible force, unstoppable force, an amazing force. Um, if I'm doing something, she's already done it, or she's doing it better, or she's doing it bigger. So, <laughs> uh, and a great inspiration for women, obviously, but also for all pharmacists that we can um, really take the ball by the horns. And um, to speak to uh, Dr. Diaz's uh, presentation, um, you know, it's it's great to be reminded of the WHO targets, and I really don't believe we will get there without the pharmacists being involved. 
um, as she says, you know, all hands on deck. We have to tackle this because TB is a historic disease. Probably it's killed more people in history than any other disease uh, besides um, diarrhea. And certainly for um, infectious uh, diseases. And, um, you know, it's important to think about what the pharmacists can do within that. Today, I want to talk about an area where I think pharmacists can have a seismic role in con uh, contributing to TB control and, and elimination. So bear with me, come with me on this journey. Um, perhaps I should just mention I'm working currently at the University of Bath, um, but I also represent today the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, who I've been working with to develop some training resources, uh, particularly around tuberculosis. So uh, I wanted to speak of my journey a little bit and uh, hear uh, a picture of when I was an undergraduate pharmacy student and I took a, a I went to Pakistan uh, to look at a project that I could do as part of my undergraduate studies. We almost do a research project. Uh, the year before I met with some friends uh, who were TB paramedics uh, in Sindh, southern Pakistan um, region. And they uh, talked to me about tuberculosis and the work they did. Um, and we went round and we met a, an older lady um, who had tuberculosis, um, but she wasn't being treated effectively because she was giving her medicines to her children, her grandchildren to protect them, not understanding that of course she will continue to have tuberculosis and in, reinfect her, her children and grandchildren. And of course, that would adversely impact on her. So the lack of understanding around how medicines are used um, uh, and uh, understanding of TB. And it really highlighted this issue of adherence. Um, I later met up with this, uh, the, the chap you can see in the rather colonial hat there, <laughs> um, a medical doctor, Canadian medical doctor. And we talked about the project I might do and he suggested looking at this issue of non-adherence. Um, and I thought, no, it's not really a pharmacy issue. He said, no, 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 if it's the one thing that is a pharmacy issue, it's non-adherence. And so we looked at a project um, identifying non-adherence using different uh, approaches to uh, measure. Um, and that really, he helped me understand that, you know, non-adherence is, of course, linked to drug resistance. If you take for uh, you know the four the four most efficacious drugs in combination to treat TB, statistically there is absolutely no chance of resistance occurring. But we know that there are things that interfere with that, and one of them is this issue of non-adherence. Um, but it really helped me understand through doing this project that adherence is essentially behavioural, um, and behaviour, as we can probably uh, we're probably aware from any human interaction, certainly with my children, that behavior is very difficult to predict. Um, and therein lies a, a big problem. But I do want to uh, underline a, another lesson about uh, non-adherence often being pointed as the patient's fault. And I think this is a, a misconception, complete misconception, because if you have a, a potentially life-threatening disease, you want to get treated, you want to get cured. And so even if um, non-adherence is intentional, it probably comes from a good place. So it's intentional, perhaps like the older lady I met, TB patient who was trying to protect her family. Um, I've, I've never met a patient, you may have, but I have yet to meet a patient who is completely belligerent I think the analogy was about a, um, a drunk driver. They uh, get drunk and then they drive knowing that they're drunk and potentially can cause harm. And that analogy being used for an MDR TB patient who is non-adherent, I just don't think that is helpful um, to kind of uh, focus on this issue because of course, almost everyone wants to get treated. And so, Quite often, the issue of non-adherence points back to us as pharmacists or healthcare professionals that we haven't um, done the best to our abilities. So uh, uh, continuing in the journey, um, I'll talk about latent tuberculosis and chemoprophylaxis. 
Uh, I followed up, I continued my research in um, TB and adherence through a PhD, and this brought me into the latent TB field um, and where we might use um, uh, the same drugs, but in different approaches, so shorter durations or mono or um, dual therapy um, to prevent uh, uh, TB disease from occurring. So understanding that if someone is infected with TB, uh, usually the immune system deals with it. And so there's only a, I say only, but there's a one in 10 lifetime chance of that latent TB or that risk of initial TB uh, infection progressing to disease. Uh, with HIV patients, that's roughly a, a one in 10 uh, yearly risk. So um, if we have 10 um, HIV patients uh, infected with TB, one of them will uh, continue to uh, exhibit symptoms and TB disease uh, every year. So that's a massive burden. Um, and the drugs that we use are not historically very nice drugs, as I'm sure we all appreciate. They don't do nice things to the liver, especially um, side effects, but also adverse drug effects. So effects that make it difficult for the patient to use the medicine or effects that have an adverse effect on the outcome of the patient. Um, and so a study we did, we looked back at the two regimens that were used in Northeast London. Um, and uh, this is historic data. So we tracked back retrospectively for patients on two regimens, isonized alone for six months or rifampicin plus isonized for three months. And that's a kaplan mayer uh, graph. You can see their cumulative survival refers not to death, it refers to completion. So if um, this is uh, the number of people that dropped out of TB, uh, of treatment effectively. Um, and you can see after three months, even um, uh, both regimens, uh, you'd expect a similar uh, completion rate, but we see a higher completion rate in the combination uh, regimen, rifampicin plus isoniazid. And that might be, the patients are psychologically more prepared to complete a three-month treatment versus a six-month treatment. Uh, we don't know. We didn't look into that. Um, but I did realize this was a huge opportunity for pharmacists in preventing TB because it's, it's essentially uh, two things that we're very good at, or we should be very good at, and that is ensuring adherence, so reducing non-adherence, making sure that the patient is informed about their medicines, can take their medicines and supported in that. Um, and also identifying adverse drug reactions primarily, also side effects, obviously, things like you know urine or uh, going uh, red or other bodily fluids or even interfering with contact lenses or uh, wearing uh, white collar shirts or something like that. So giving them advice, but particularly looking out for those uh, signs that uh, of liver damage particularly or eyesight or so on and so forth. So it's it's sort of because that's essentially what we're doing. We're not really treating a disease. We're treating a risk of disease. And for nine people out of the 10 that we're treating, um, they may as well not be treated for it. So we have to be very careful um, using the medicines that we are using, that we don't do more harm than good. And the importance, therefore, in finding shorter, safer regimens. Just to refer to this, this article that is not so new, five years now, but um, uh, was a real kind of eye-opener for me and a, a way forward, potentially. Uh, and it looked at using a slightly different combination, rifapentine, which has been mooted for some time, but now with some clear evidence behind it, uh, in combination with isoniazid uh, for one month or three months. And uh, just draw your attention to the table in the, in the uh, right-hand corner there that compares uh, those two regimens. And this was, by the way, amongst uh, HIV patients. So looking at the, great, the, the best um, opportunity uh, for the highest risk group. And you can see the endpoint there, which was essentially death. So 
uh, by due to TB or other cause. So similar rates of um, uh, untoward outcome um, and similar rates, if not even better for the shorter regimen of um, adverse drug reactions. Sorry, I think I misspoke. I said it was a comparison between uh, one and three month um, isoniazid and rifepentine. I was I was reading the slide wrong. This is a comparison between one month isoniazid plus rifepentine versus nine months isoniazid, and that was the standard of care. But you can see the adverse drug profile um, is similar, if not better for the shorter regimen containing rifepentine. And the completion rates, as we would expect from the research that I did earlier, uh, presented earlier, uh, were much higher. And that's really important to have any great impact in, 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 a, in a public health intervention. You need to have as many people participating and completing as possible. Otherwise, you won't see the effect size that you, you desire. Now, they didn't look at cost, but obviously we can surmise that, um, you know, one month treatment versus nine month treatment in direct cost, if you think about the drugs involved, but healthcare services or indirect costs. So looking at the impact on patients, uh, convenience and uh, morbidity, mortality and so on. Um, uh, that that it, it's likely to be preferable having a shorter regimen. Um, now to get to the to get to the point really of this presentation because it's meant to be about pharmacists' involvement in drug uh, resistance. It's not such a um, a big thought to think how this might impact on resistance because if you um, cut off the the head of the snake rather than chasing its tail, that's the way I express it, uh, you're going to be more successful. In other words, if we prevent the resistance from occurring in the first place in terms of secondary resistance, so, you know, that's the development of resistance while a patient's being treated. And even if we're using combination regimens more effectively uh, to suppress the resistance that people might have inherited by getting infected with a resistant form of tuberculosis, it's going to have a positive impact on um, reducing resistance rates generally. Um, and this needs a systems approach. Uh, so again, uh, thinking about uh, Dr. Diaz's uh, presentation, us all being involved, um, we have a huge workforce, I, I believe globally, certainly in the UK, um, but globally, I think uh, in the healthcare field, pharmacists are the third largest um, professional group. Uh, so we have uh, strength in numbers. We are ubiquitous. And this is what Manjiri and I have often talked about. You know, uh, in Northeast London, where I worked, there was one TB clinic and 50 uh, pharmacies in that particular borough in Northeast London. So you can imagine that access to a pharmacist is open and freer and easier. Uh, this is an exercise in medicines management, essentially, giving a patient medicines and monitoring the medicines thereafter. Um, so we have, we have the population necessary to deliver and scale up to a systems approach uh, using this. Um, I think the, the, do I have another slide? I think I'm on my last slide, but I think the, it's important to note that you know, we have been waiting for some time for a better vaccine. Uh, BCG hasn't delivered on the promise, uh, the intended promise that we know. It has other positive effects, uh, not to undermine that. Uh, we can continue waiting for a vaccine, but there is a different approach that I've just presented here um, to help towards reducing TB generally, reducing the impact of resistance and also working towards elimination. The final thing, that actually two things very quickly, because I think Manjiri is here to prompt me um, coming to the end of my 15 minutes, but technology has caught up uh, to say that we all we have the shorter, safer regimens, but we also have better diagnostics uh, for latent TB. And we also have point of care liver function tests that can monitor on at scale and in the community uh, the, the main bad effects of the medicines on the human body and the liver. 
the the final point is of course there's always a challenge of how to fund this um, and that's the space that I'm working in now uh, particularly with some colleagues in Zambia to see how we might demonstrate that this is a cost-effective approach uh, to scale up um, and deliver to reduce the TB. Thank you very much for your attention. I believe that is all. And I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, team. And it's always a pleasure working with you, as you said, for the last 12 years or so. More than that, we have been discussing TB and working together. Uh, wonderful work done by you in area of resistance, uh, in area of uh, adherence, and uh, especially in the in Pakistan, and also the points which you brought in today uh, that cutting the snake's head is better than the following and cutting the tail of the snake. So I think this is a really good approach uh, that prevention of the resistance by involving the pharmacist is better than thinking of what role pharmacists can play in the drug resistance TB. So uh, this is very important point. Also the point which you brought in regarding the POC, the point of care testing. Uh, yeah, we need to work more in this area uh, to bring in the POC in pharmacies where the pharmacist role can be involved, uh, can be enhanced. Uh, I know that you have another engagement and you need to leave this digital event. So I would take this opportunity to ask one or two questions before you leave. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, so, perfect. Uh, yeah. So we heard you, all your good work, and you gave a perfect direction about the prevention, the prevention of the resistance. Uh, I would like to ask you, what next are you thinking? I mean, what is the need of the hour for the TB elimination? And how do you see pharmacists placed? Yeah, I think the next stage is to demonstrate how this, how we can use all the tools available to us. Obviously, I focus just on uh, shorter regimens, but the, the technology that's available to support scale up of preventive treatment, where pharmacists as a workforce, and not just pharmacists, of course, but where pharmacists can contribute. Um, and that's a, that's a massive proposition, I, uh, but I think... Uh, this is an opportunity not just for controlling TB, but also for elimination. So I think that we need to convince the Gates Foundation or Global Fund <laughs> to support some uh, studies to, to, uh, to demonstrate a, a point of principle more clearly to show that it can be done in, for example, Zambia, uh, where I'm trying to work, um, uh, and scaled up worldwide, because I think... You don't want to jump into, like I think you said, Manjiri, 25% of TB is in India. In India you want to yeah. demonstrate that this is successful at a smaller scale and then translate mm -hmm. it to other countries. And scale it up, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one more question. You spoke about TB and HIV, the association between the TB and HIV, which is much well known. Uh, how about some of the NCDs like diabetes and tuberculosis? Uh, I think they go hand in hand and... Uh, Diabetic patients are more, they're more vulnerable to get tuberculosis, to develop active TB. Uh, I see a big role for the pharmacist in this area. Uh, I want to ask you your inputs on this. Yeah, I think um, uh, people in the audience and yourselves have much more clinical experience than me, but certainly um, uh, patients with latent TB, for example, are more likely to progress the TB disease if they have diabetes um, and the, the complexities of treatment. And they're also more likely to have a, a, an untoward outcome uh, if yeah. they have TB disease or plus diabetes. Yes. Um, and of course, uh, you know, pharmacists have been heavily involved in diabetic care uh, yes. for very long. And it's mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, um, some work that was done in Namibia where I worked for 10 years was Mm -hmm. uh, looking at how how systems work within public health systems in particular quite often you have you know the tb clinic and then the hiv clinic the diabetes clinic and they run longitudinally separate to each other but really yes. how to integrate those care systems integrate um, the services. yeah exactly mm -hmm. so obviously so by uh, screening yeah 
Maybe. Yeah, I'm more of a health systems person than a pharmacist now, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but clinically, I'm sure, yeah, there's certainly roles pharmacists can play more specifically. Yes. And you have worked across three continents, and that's incredible. <laughs> Africa, wow. Asia, and United Kingdom. So that's the yeah. I get itchy feet. That's the expression. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And then we would love to have you till the end. But if you need to leave, uh, please, uh, you can feel free to do so. But if you can come back, you can join our question and answer session uh, towards the end. Thank you so much. Thank you much. so much. Nice. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Tim. So... Now we'll have uh, our next speaker, Dr. Rosalind Miller. Um, Rosalind uh, spent over a decade based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she was an assistant professor. She spent the past decade researching the private sector in low and middle income countries with a, a specific focus on pharmacies. Her main research interest lies in better understanding and improving the use of medicines, in particular addressing illegal and inappropriate sales of antibiotics over the counter. So Rosalind, welcome. She will present us how can pharmacists um, to be more effectively involved in TB care. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to Check that my slides, yes, it is. Um, so yes, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, as um, you just said, most of my research over the last many years has um, focused on harnessing the potential of pharmacists to help achieve public health goals, because I believe that pharmacists are really important, um, although I would say that because I am a pharmacist. Um, but jokes aside, also they're often a very overlooked part of the health system. What I'm going to talk about today is a project that I've been working on with the TB PPM Learning Network, which has focused on pharmacy engagement in TB. Um, the TB PPM Learning Network, it's based in Canada out of McGill University. Um, it's a dynamic online global community and it fosters learning and exchange to engage private providers in TB prevention and care. So I want to just start off by recapping why pharmacy engagement in TB prevention and control efforts is so relevant and important. So over 4 million people globally with TB are missing. Um, and by missing, I mean those who develop TB each year but are not diagnosed, treated or reported to national programs. And as for many illnesses, pharmacies are a common first point of contact for people with symptoms suggestive of TB. So symptoms such as long lasting cough and fever. And as such, this makes them really well placed to contribute to and improve case finding efforts, thus reducing that huge missing figure. However, um, prior research has identified issues in quality management of people um, with presumptive TB at pharmacies. And that includes things like inappropriate over the counter sale of medicines, including those that are prescription only. So um, antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, steroids, cough suppressants, all of which can mask symptoms and end up to a delayed diagnosis. Um, research has also shown that there's often a lack of referral of patients for sputum testing. And this figure on the right, um, it shows a public private mix guideline from WHO back in 2006. And in that document, it clearly lists the importance of engaging pharmacists in public private mix efforts. And the guidance also noted um, pharmacy associations among the PPM stakeholders for engagement at the national level. But um, to this day, a lack of uptake and engagement of pharmacists in TB programs persists. So given the potential that pharmacies have to play in TB prevention and control, colleagues from the TB PPM Learning Network, FIP and others working on pharmacy engagement in TB around the world, including hybrid in countries of India, Nigeria, Kenya, and Pakistan. We got together and published this editorial in BMJ Global Health on how we can better engage pharmacists in the fight against TB. Um, I've popped the reference at the bottom of the slide. 
And in this article, we outlined three priority areas for action, um, which I've listed here on this slide. And I'd like to go through each of those in turn today. So we'll start with the first action, which was access to clear and concise pharmacy specific guidance. Um, so prior research had highlighted that there was a lack of explicit guidelines for how pharmacists should manage patients with cough. Um, and there might have been stuff for other healthcare providers, but there was nothing really um, only directed at pharmacies. So over the last couple of years, we've worked to address this gap. And we wanted to start off by creating a simple infographic that could be used at the global level and was legitimized by global level endorsement. And it's been fantastic to work with FYP to achieve this goal. And you can see the infographic on the screen here. Um, and we now have this educational tool that is ready to be disseminated globally. Um, many stakeholders from a wide range of backgrounds and countries were involved in the creation of this infographic, including colleagues from FYP, other academics, and also national TB program managers and implementers and representatives from a wide range of international organizations. And we made the infographic publicly available in around summer 2023. Um, so let's just have a little look at the infographic in more detail. So it has a simple, on the, in the, right in the middle with the lungs, it has a simple do's and don'ts list which includes key medicines that are really detrimental to sell over the counter because they mask symptoms and delay diagnosis. It also includes antibiotics that if misused can contribute to resistance. So those are under the don't column. Um, it's also got on the left a list of symptoms to look out for. Um, in the right hand corner, we've included a statistic about the missing cases and a bit of a call to pharmacists to help contribute to finding those missing patients. And finally, at the bottom, we've included some medicines that can be safely sold over the counter if pharmacists do want to recommend um, their patients something to buy. Um, so the completed infographic, it was, pu it was published in the aforementioned BMJ article and on the TB PPM Learning Network platform. Um, we started off by contacting 15 countries to see if they wanted to participate in this initiative by using the infographic. And seven countries sent us their logos to be incorporated into the infographic for further dissemination. So you can see on the right, some of those countries. Um, they also, some countries wanted to adapt it to make it more appropriate for use in that setting. So you can see on the right are examples I've included from Vietnam and Myanmar. And we're in continual discussion with other countries on how to best tailor the infographic for use in various countries. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to add Petra's details. She's the community manager at the TB PPM Learning Network. And if anyone does want to get in touch with her about further use and adaptation of the infographic, that would be great. Um, so in addition to the work that I described in the previous slide, FIP have since made a huge effort to translate the infographic into 20 languages. Um, and there's a specific focus on languages spoken in high burden settings. Um, so it's so amazing that we now have all of these ready to use and adapt for, um, for countries to adapt as they see fit. Um, the versions that I've added on this slide, they're all available on the FIP website. And we really um, want to urge national pharmacy associations to work with national TV programs to adapt and disseminate as widely as possible. Um, so obviously whilst having clear and accurate information on how to identify potential TV cases, this is only the first step in the pharmacist's in the cascade of care for TB. Um, it's then key to make sure that those identified patients make it to the next stage of testing and treatment. And that leads me to our second action, which is to establish and strengthen mechanisms that will allow people with presumptive TB to be screened in pharmacies, and then really importantly, linked to national TB systems. Um, so a recent review which drew on global experiences of interventions for improving engagement of pharmacists in TB care, um, they concluded that national TB programs must actively engage pharmacies in the continuum of care for people with presumptive TB. 
Um, and the first step is for, yeah, for those national programs to actively engage and work with pharmacies. Um, a substantial loss to follow up has been reported at the stage of people being referred to actually get into the testing. And so addressing this bottleneck in the system is crucial. Um, obviously establishing point of care testing in the pharmacy is an obvious way to present, prevent this loss, um, but there's no simple point of care test at the moment that can be used. Um, so I just want to look at a couple of examples and things that are going on um, that we can like draw inspiration from. So um, there was a study, an intervention study um, that was done in Patna in India, and they gave pharmacists digital chest x-ray vouchers to pass on to people with presumptive TB. Um, and the program also included training in TB screening, incentives for referral completion, and TB diagnosis, and um, text reminders and field support. Um, and this resulted in substantial increases in case detection. So the rate of registration of symptomatic patients was 62 times higher in intervention group compared to the control group. TB diagnosis was 25 times higher and microbiological testing and test confirmation was also higher. Um, and the cost incurred um, through the incentives and other parts of the program was 100 US dollars per case detected. So that needs to be traded off against the cost of patients not being detected in the first place. Um, then on the right, I've included an example from Nigeria, which is Shops Plus. And they have, um, for a few years now, been doing um, a hub and spoke initiative. Um, so the spokes, which include pharmacies, are facilities that don't have capacity for TB diagnosis and treatment, but they can do things like screening, collecting sputum samples, and then they drive traffic into the hubs for further treatment. And the images I've popped up here from the project give an overview of case finding that's been enabled by National Initiative, um, which includes community pharmacies and other um, private providers as well. And as you can see that in the three years of data collected in this um, slide, they found over 23,000 cases. Um, so these are you know, examples of what was going on and what is possible. Um, and finally, our third action was about um, utilizing advancements in digital technologies to improve the linkage between pharmacies and TB programs and surveillance. So while paper-based forms and printed referral slips have been used in the past, there's just an increased recognition that we need to embrace digital technology. Not only can these digital linkages, um, it's, it, it can enable digital linkage, but it can also um, allow the development of dashboards to improve decision-making on data collected from pharmacies. So a few examples. Um, in Pakistan, the Dapazi Foundation, they've launched a mobile app which allows um, tracing, notifying and follow up of those affected by TB. So they've worked with private pharmacies in the province of Punjab. And so in this project, pharmacies, um, they were enrolled on the app and they were given access to training videos with continuous support um, to ensure that they would notify all people who are purchasing TB medication and they would fill in their details. And then patient telephone numbers were recorded, which could then be used for follow-up and support to encourage patients to continue with their treatment. Um, and around 16,000 notifications were made in the year between April 21 and March 22 from around 3,000 pharmacies. And that showed it was around a 20 to 30% increase in notifications from prior. Also in India, there's the Nikshe portal, which is an electronic TB notification and data analysis um, system um, for those pharmacies which are connected with the national program. And they also have a pilot initiative underway, which is capturing patient, provider, and anti-TB medication, and an integrated billing software, which enables generation of real-time information. And find, my final example is SwipeRx. I'm not sure if, how many people have heard of that. It's based in Southeast Asia and it's actually a privately run initiative business app. Um, it calls itself a digital networking app. Um, and they work in all um, 
disease areas and they do all sorts of things. But one of the things is that they educate pharmacy professionals um, on TB and this increases referrals and screening. So for example, they have TB CPD modules that you can take. Um, they've also partnered with USAID and they did a project in Indonesia where um, they exposed their 100 and hundred odd thousand users in Indonesia to evidence-based messages promoting TB screening in the pharmacy. And they have various other campaigns um, going on in Southeast Asian countries. Um, but one thing to note is that obviously we want to engage pharmacists and we want them to help with case finding efforts. Um, but one thing that a lot of research has shown is that often the it's not a two-way feedback. So pharmacists are sending patients and they're sending all of that information on one way, but often they don't receive feedback on you know, how their efforts are going. I think that's really important for any programs moving forward. Um, so in summary, just to go over my sort of whistle-stop tour of that paper of what I've included today, is that um, it's clear that pharmacies do have a crucial role to play in TB case finding. Um, and it's really paramount that national TB programs work with pharmacy associations and actively include pharmacists in TB control efforts. Um, we've produced this really simple and clear infographic as an educational tool because education and knowledge is the first step. Um, and it's just, you know, to show how we need to manage patients with cough. Um, but future initiatives really need to focus on sort of closing that gap between screening and getting patients to treatment. And um, financial incentives should be considered. Um, expansion of digital systems could play a key role. And then just finally, pharmacies are really well placed for future initiatives in the pipeline, such as TB vaccine and point of care testing. So that's all for me. So I've put Petra's details there if anyone wants to get in touch about the infographic. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you thank so you much, so Rosalie, much. for this brilliant uh, presentation. We will now move on to our panel discussion. So I will ask for our speakers to, to open your camera and join us. And we already have some questions on the K A toolbox. So I have here one question to, to Monica regarding your, your slide. Um, that is, why Kenya has a different pattern for notification than the other countries presented when you present a public-public mix um, that is, in this case, is much higher than the private-public mix? And if um, WHO have done similar analysis to countries in which the public health systems is more comprehensive. Monica. Thanks so much, Katia. And um, thank you for uh, the question, Louisa. So, um, so for Kenya, in this uh, instance, what is reported, as I started off by saying, we hear from, uh, we collect, WHO collates data from over 200 countries. This is presented annually in our global tuberculosis report. Um, maybe one of my colleagues can post um, the link to the report online. Um, you can get uh, country specific data on all of these points. So we do have comprehensive data across. Now, in the case of Kenya, what you see there in that slide is actually the contribution of um, contribution to overall notifications of people diagnosed with TB, both from public unengaged providers as well as public, you know, the public sector care providers who are already intrinsic to the system. This is why um, the quantity seems so high in the case of Kenya. This year, we will have a bit more disaggregated data. Um, for the other countries, of course, it's only reporting from public unengaged providers. This is why you see that stark uh, difference. So well uh, spotted. So just to kind of maybe come back on that. So we have you know, public public mix, which includes uh, public sector care providers that are not working with national programs or not directly linked, because you need to get them to notify uh, TB patients based on, you know, given that it's a, 
uh, you know, it's a, it's a contagious disease, uh, airborne disease. So it's important. Many countries have laws about it. So it's important to notify. So one of the steps we've taken as part of public-private mix is to make sure we have private care providers engaged as well as public sector care providers engaged. In Kenya, these providers could include prisons, defense, you know, the defense sector, it could also include corporate sector uh, from the public sector perspective. So there's a huge range of care providers. And this is why it's very important when we look at ending TB to map out who the key care providers are to make sure we work with them. And uh, pharmacies, of course, are one of those providers where we really need to engage, which is the focus of this discussion. I'll stop there. Thank you, Katya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, and regarding with this thematic also, we have another question that I will ask first to Rosalind and Monica, of course, if you want to add something, that it's about the role of pharmacists um, and pharma in, in the, the pharmacists uh, in vaccines and POC testing, but also more uh, specifically about the, uh, refer the, the re how can we referring people with TB symptoms from pharmacies, in this case specific to molecular WHO recommended rapid diagnostic test facilities. So I think that we have here both situation. It is the, the, the case that the pharmacist can do uh, POC testing and the case that we can referring people to other facilities. So can you please share some best practice, some tools, that can be useful for uh, all the pharmacies that hear us today? Sure. So I think in the absence of, you know, point of care testing in the pharmacy, it's about closing this gap between the, you know, we've got the patients and we want to refer them. Um, and I think sputum collection and transport is really, really important because um, sputum can be collected in the pharmacy um, and that is what they're doing in um, Nigeria. Um, but it's about making sure that that sputum gets tested. So I think programs can have dedicated like transport systems just to prevent that sputum getting, you know, that not getting tested. And also just really important to have patient details. So if you collect the sputum and you have patient details and you have a dedicated collection system and then a way that you can get in touch with patients, I think that's really important rather than just saying, oh, like you should pop off and go and have, get tested for TB. It needs to be like, right, you need a test, here's your sputum and let's make sure that gets to the lab and then we can follow up if necessary. Um, and I also think, you know, incentives for pharmacists to initiate testing in the first place is also really important. I showed that that one study from India was showing 100 US dollars per case detected. But if you think about the cost of undiagnosed TB, people going around and you know how many people they're going to infect I think you could actually say that that is you know sustainable and cost effective. Thank you. Monica do you want to add something about this this question? Sure. Um, so in the case of rapid tests WHO recommended rapid tests like expert in CBNAT and other tests are really important now as the first point of care and first point of diagnosis, right, beyond microscopy. So it's becoming really critical. One of the targets that I mentioned was getting to 100% coverage of these rapid tests. And yes, pharmacies can play an important role, but I think it's very country specific because it depends on what policies each country um, sets up. Um, you know, and also the willingness of pharmacists to take on more roles. And I think Manjiri has, uh, in the past, I remember we've done these studies, you know, pharmacies are often very crowded, you know, you need to have a specific space uh, because you're talking about handling all of the infectious substances. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the space available, um, the level of pharmacy uh, that you're talking about. Is it a high end or, you know, are you talking about primary care? What are the facilities available so that these things can be done safely? But what definitely can be done is um, the you know, the screening. So a person coming and mentioning what the symptoms are. I mean, we all, the first point of care would be the pharmacist to say, okay, I'm coughing, I have these symptoms, you know, give me something to help. 
the first suggestion could be that um, you know you you can go to either a accredited private sector care provider which you know is around the corner or a public sector care provider that you know is doing these tests and you can also give information to say actually you know you can get your tests in under 100 minutes if you get it done like this you go to this accredited uh, provider and you can get your test done so you can provide more pharmacists can provide more awareness also about the fact that rapid tests exist like expert or like cbnat etc and they can avail of it so i think there are several roles that can be played and this is why it's important to have that public private sector engagement so that pharmacies can work with national tb programs following the core guidelines needed so that they are also safe. Pharmacists have to be safe as well, have a safe environment, as well as they are providing the right care to those who seek it from them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Completely agree. Manjiri, do you want to move on? Uh, yeah, I just wanted, thanks, Katia. I just wanted to add uh, to what Monica said. What you said is this is very country specific. Yes, I totally agree that this is kind of involving the pharmacist in diagnostic. Uh, it's very country specific. In our project so far, we have tried that referring the pharmacist have been referring the just symptomatic cases, the patients who are walking in and having cough uh, and they are looking sick, they're losing weight. The pharmacist knows the patients very well, being the first point of contact for them. And pharmacists and patients uh, share good friendly relationship. So they know the patient well. And so they try to refer to the the case to, as Monica said, to the uh, accredited private provider, private diagnostic lab, or to the public health facility. And then pharmacists have been, you know, kind of chasing the patient. Have you been there? Uh, but then we see some dropout. We see some dropout. And what Monica, we did was we also tried to inform the public health facility, uh, you know, the field visitors, and give them the information about these patients that they may come to you. If not, you go to them. So kind of trying to get the patient in the system, getting them diagnosed and putting them on the treatment, if positive, has been the case. Also collecting the sputum in the pharmacies have been tried, have been taught. But again, you know, uh, teaching the patient how to give the sputum out, that is also very important. And so that uh, we thought, and then the sputum collection in time, that is also important by, so we try to rope in another NGO along with IPA to do that. And so some experiments have been done, but I really wish we have a POC, point of care test, which can give us quick results. And that can be done through the pharmacist. That can give us, uh, I mean, the big success in finding out the Absolutely. cases which Absolutely. we are missing. And uh, Katia, before we you move on, I just want to say, I. Rosalind, I love your presentation and the infographic that has been made, very useful. And I would uh, like to thank our colleagues from India, Africa, China, Spain, Turkey, Vietnam, and Portugal for translating uh, these infographics. So big thank you to the colleagues for you know, doing this translation like within a week and giving back to FIP uh, so that it can be released today. So thank you so much, colleagues, for this support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are almost at the end of our event, so I would like to might ask uh, each of our panelists to provide a practical take-home final message for pharmacists uh, listening. So, Monica, please, final take-home message. So, final take-home message is that this is a millennia-old disease. I started with the, that. It, that it really? claims... Really? claims millions of lives and it's vital that we have all hands on deck. Uh, pharmacists are one of the important providers. We know that the full potential hasn't been expanded. So the take home message is that back when you head back, back to your countries, I mean, in your countries, if we can start this uh, process of working closely, getting more engaged in ending TB, um, in efforts uh, through um, your own work, through pharmacy associations. And importantly, we hope that we can continue this collaboration with FIP to renew our engagement so that we can really get pharmacies on deck as one of you know, the pathfinders or the leaders in, you know, helping close that gap and making sure that everybody is able to access 
quality uh, prevention, diagnosis, and care when they need it. So we really, um, you know, we really hope that we can work very closely with you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Your take-home message. Um, so I think if we're talking just specifically for pharmacists who are practicing, I would just say that any patient that presents in your pharmacy with a long-standing cough is just to think of TB and, you know, is it associated with the other symptoms? Um, you know, ask those questions, explore that. Um, and then if I'm thinking at sort of higher level national pharmacy associations, We'd really urge them to um, take on board the educational tool that we've made and to disseminate it as widely as possible um, so that, you know, pharmacies can just have that to refer to and a reminder to um, think of those patients with cough and know what to do with them so that we can, I just really think pharmacists are a key place to improve case detection. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. So now we will uh, remind you that the recording of this episode of this webinar will be um, available on the, our FIP webpage. Please provide your feedback um, through the, the, the emails with webinars at FIP.org. So FIP may continue to improve their digital event offerings. So now um, I would like to also to give a brief note about our uh, our Congress. Um, as you all know, it will be in September 1 uh, to uh, 4 September 2024. It will be in Cape Town in South Africa. As you know, um, we'll have an early bird registration deadline um, on May until May 31. Uh, and you, you, you can also um, see more information about the Congress on FIP uh, website. Also to remind you that, that the abstract submission is closed um, and the results will be announced until, um, until April. So uh, our last minute will be to, um, to, to thank you all for your attendance and to our brilliant speakers. Uh, Manjiri, if you want to, to, to finish our webinar, thank you so much. Thanks, Katya. Uh, yes, so we are at the conclusion part of this wonderful webinar. Many, many thanks to all the attendees for their active participation. And of course, to our speakers, Monica, Tim, and Rosalind. Uh, before we end this webinar, I can see some of the questions which just popped up here, Katya, at the last moment. And I would encourage them to write to us. Like there is one question regarding that some of the pharmacies are manned by chemists. Uh, I understand uh, the they want to say that the pharmacist is not present in the pharmacy. Yes, I agree in some parts of the country, this is the problem. And the regulatory network, regulatory framework has to be very strict in enforcing the law. Uh, another question from Indonesia, I saw just now which came up that uh, how to move forward involving the pharmacists because there is no regulatory framework there or no norms. I would uh, like to say to my, our Indonesian colleague that involve, go to your associations, the pharmacist associations, talk to them, and then they can talk to FIP, and then the pharmacy association can be a good advocate to the government uh, that they can engage the pharmacist, so that they can engage the pharmacist in the TB care and control. So that's what has been done in some other parts of the country. So the same model can be replicated. So please contact your national association, and then we can take it forward, definitely. Uh, so as all agreed and all emphasized, the pharmacist has a huge role to play in TB prevention, care, and control. The pharmacist being the first point of contact, gateway to the healthcare, they have tremendous scope and a role to play in fight against TB. Uh, but as all have agreed that the whole potential, the true potential of the pharmacist is not yet realized. And the thanks, Monica, for saying this again and again, that the true potential has not been utilized, yes. So we need to put all of our efforts, FIP, WHO, all the national member organizations, 
and the individual pharmacists that we need to come together and work further for finding out those missing cases. So the case finding remains a very important role for the pharmacists. Also the treatment adherence, community awareness, the reporting of ADRs, as Dr. Tim said, uh, use of technology that would, can that can support the pharmacist's role. And we all together need to work uh, and fight against the TB because it has been a very historic uh, infection and it has not gone away, but it in fact, it has become a major public health crisis by posing a risk of resistant TB. So we all work together uh, in fight against TB. Uh, and thank you again for the patient listening to all our attendees and for their enthusiastic and active participation. Thank you, Katya. And thank you to our FIP team for organizing this uh, event. And thanks again, million thanks to Monica and Rosalind and Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.